Uh, hi everyone. I'm Rahul. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, I was using a beta app for presenting. It didn't work out. So yeah. So uh, today in this talk, I'll be presenting a, a side project which I did. Uh, it's it was just about writing a simple DNS resolver in Go. So uh, every one of us comes across DNS in our daily lives, and this is about uh, how you can implement your own DNS resolver. So uh, a resolver is basically which translates a domain name into an IP, and uh, yeah, this this project is about writing your own DNS resolver into in in Go. So yeah, let me start. Uh, so just some things about me. I am Rahul. I work at Simple, and uh, I can write Go and Python, and I play football. So yeah. So uh, coming to DNS, uh, DNS was drafted uh, in the RFC 1035, and uh, DNS stands for Domain Name System, as we all know. And uh, if you're aware about DNS, then uh, I the official RFC actually talks about uh, DNS as a mixture of functions and data types. Uh, and these functions and data types constitute a protocol. And uh, DNS uses a UDP protocol, port 53 for communication. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, say if you're typing a domain name in your browser, your browser will ultimately uh, establish a UDP connection to get the, say, say if you're typing google.com, it'll get that resolved to uh, Google's uh, nearest IP. So uh, it, uh, uh, we need to know about these two terms before we go ahead. Um, a resolver is basically uh, it, it's it's its duty is to connect to the name server and get the information associated with a particular domain name. Uh, and coming to name server, since I mentioned it, name server think about it as a database uh, that makes up the domain space. So a name name server a, a very simple name server would have uh, mappings from domain name to IP for uh, a lot of domain names. So uh, since since we are uh, all are very familiar with the client uh, client server communication, so this is how I wanted it to uh, look like. So say uh, in in our our case, say if a user program is uh, just a command line app or your browser or anything, say if the browser requests example.com uh, to the resolver, the resolver talks to the name server, pass like it it builds a DNS query and passes it to the name server. The name server returns a DNS response. Now the resolver's duty is to again uh, decode the response and return the answer in the DNS uh, response. So this is how it looks like. The resolver is placed in the uh, center where the resolver is the client, the name server is the server. So this is how uh, a DNS message looks like. So. You just saw there's a DNS query here. DNS query also has a DNS uh, message format. And this is the specification for uh, a DNS message. A DNS message contains a header. This is the most important part of a DNS message. And I think uh, we'll be talking about uh, and we'll be mostly differentiating between a dif uh, DNS message using the header. So a header contains a lot of uh, meta information like which record is this? So if you're aware about DNS records, there are a bunch of records, uh, which include the most infamous, the A record, which is the mapping of your domain name to IP, and the MX record, which has details about your emails, and, and other uh, bunch of records, like a name server record, and uh, so on. Uh, apart from the header, we have a question. Question is basically, so so, you just saw a DNS query here. So whenever we're sending a query, we're going to fill the question part of the DNS message. And uh, we're going to ask the name server a question uh, saying, this is the domain name. Do you have information about this? And answer is basically what the DNS name server will respond with. It will have uh, one or more uh, resource records that will have the answer uh, for the question which we asked. And then we have uh, the other two sections, which are authority and additional. So additional would be, it will contain additional information. Uh, it, it might not be related to the query directly, but it can eventually lead us to the answer. 
and uh, authority is it, it's basically for uh, a specific type of name server i think it's uh, authoritative name servers that can be used to continue the resolution so say uh, we we hit a name server and that name server doesn't have information about the domain name which we requested so what that name server will do is that it will tell us that you might want to check with these name servers these name servers might have the information so this is where uh, authority comes into the play so yeah now let's jump into the implementation uh, uh, so as i talked that we'll be implementing the resolver in go so go has uh, structs to represent uh, uh, information and uh, here i have represented a header and a question so if you'll see the header size as i mentioned in the previous slide it was 12 bytes so 12 bytes if if you are having an unsigned integer of 16 bits it uh, totals up to 2 bytes because uh, each 8 bit constitutes one byte so 2 bytes and if you if you see there are 6 uh, fields here the so 6 into 2 it becomes 12 similarly we have a, a dns question so dns question has a name uh, the domain name which we want to query about and uh, type and class but i th i don't think we'll be using these fields for now but uh, uh, i've just mentioned them so uh, before we uh, jump into how a dns query is built it's really important to understand that uh, for computers uh, the domain names which we use are not as easy to interpret uh, as it is for us because our grammar is uh, say if we if we know english grammar then we'll perceive this domain name using that english grammar but computers will not know usually about the english grammar and they they use uh, binary as we all know so uh, to make it easier for the computer to resolve uh, what we do is that uh, the domain name uh, it it is actually a sequence of labels so a, a domain name also called a fqdn uh, consists of a sequence of labels and uh, here each label uh, is in a hierarchy so if you'll see uh, if you start from the right it's in the highest hierarchy so say uh, .com is the highest hierarchy and uh, then as we move away from .com uh, we we will jump into domains subdomains and subdomains so uh, the hierarchy keeps on decreasing but uh, it it becomes increasingly important to encode the D the dns name in such a way that the resolver is able to parse it so here's an example which uh, i'm using as so if you'll see i'm using this domain called api.getsimple.com uh, so what we do is that we find the length of uh, the subdomain and uh, prefix it before the actual name so if you'll see the above a uh, domain name uh, gets encoded into 3 which is the length of api 8 which is the length of get simple 3 uh, and then com and uh, now we tell the computer that it's fine now you don't need to continue parsing and we end it by a null byte so null byte is being represented as a zero here so this is how an encoding would look like for a domain name so and and this is the implementation of the uh, domain name encoder function uh if you'll see what i'm doing is that uh i'm i'm splitting the entire domain name and uh what i'm doing is that i'm writing i i initialized a buffer here and what i'm doing is that first i write the length of the uh splitted part and then i write the part itself i'm converting it into bytes so say if the input is example.com it 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 will look like something this and if you'll see uh lastly i append an empty byte here and then i uh, write the entire thing to the bytes buffer so by the way this implementation is inspired from a blog which uh, julia evans wrote it's about implementing dns in a weekend and the original implementation is in python but i thought i'll write it in go just to experiment that's all so yeah uh, coming back to the implementation so uh, right now if we'll again go back to our client server model uh, we just built a part of uh, our dns query and the dns query uh, looked like this the name type and class so right now we're just gonna uh, for just the, let's just ignore type and class for now and uh, till now we have encoded the domain name successfully and uh, 
we'll pass that in the question so now let's build our dns query so uh, this is the function which builds the dns query if you'll see uh, so recursion desired is a flag mentioned in the rfc if you want to recursively uh, resolve the domain which you are looking for or if you want to rely on the response of a single name server and skip the recursion so what we do is that first of all we build the header we tell the name name server that uh, uh, we are asking a single question and that question is uh, we pass the encoded domain name and the record type we are requesting the a record so uh, the a record is being passed as one uh, it, again it's mentioned in the rfc i think after the entire thing i'll also browse through the rfc quickly and once that is done i again initialize a, a buffer of bytes and write the header and the question to the query so now our query is ready and uh, now let's send a dns query to a real name server so this is how uh, right now we are sending it to uh, a, a actual name server so first of all we got our query ready from the build query function which i showed you earlier we create a udp socket and uh, send our query to the infamous google name server so if you'll go into your uh, etc resolve.conf you might see uh, this 8.8.8 .8 which is google's name server and uh, then we write this query to the uh, name server so he here is where that trivia comes into picture where uh, i was talking about dns uses udp as a Uh, protocol and the port 53 to connect so we're just sending the query to google's name server and once that is done uh, we uh, read the response returned by uh, the name server so usually dns responses are less than 512 bytes there's a there's a good bunch of reading around uh, why it is less than 512 bytes and why it is not because in many cases it can be more than 512 bytes uh, as well so newer protocols like dnssec and uh, which which implement additional security over dns are usually a lot more than 512 bytes but since we like for for oversimplification we just want to uh, test a simple dns resolver uh, hence we are just talking about we are just reading uh, uh, 1024 bytes so once that is done we again open open a new uh, reading buffer from the response and uh, now let's jump into uh, parsing the response so again going back to the client server model we have successfully sent a query to the name server and now we are getting the response back and try so the resolver now parses the response back from the name server yeah so first of all since the header is the most important part uh, we parse the header so in the in the python implementation uh, uh, the the author uses uh, the struct dot unpack from python uh, and similarly we here use uh, binary dot read binary is uh, a standard package provided by go what it does is that it it will write the by bytes which we receive into uh, whatever we pass so for example i'm here passing a reference to the header which we created so i created a header object and uh, then i'm passing the header object to uh, the binary dot read function and uh, here if you'll see uh, the encoding type has been mentioned here as big endian so um, usually computers use little endian for encoding but uh, mostly networking protocols use big endian and uh, also a fun trivia to share here uh, big indian and little indian uh, these terms came from the famous uh, lilliput story so there were two groups uh, little indian and big indian uh, where uh, the little indians used to crack their eggs from the smaller side and the big indian used to crack their egg from the bigger side and the actual difference here is uh, big indian is usually interpreted from right to left and the latter uh, from left to right and once that is done we parse the response into this dns header the same same dns header struct which we were using before uh now comes uh, since we encoded the domain name uh, we also need to uh, decode it back uh, i think this might not be clearly visible is this visible 
this okay then we can do one thing we can oh thanks thank you yeah, then i'll go there and or else uh, when we are doing the hands on i'll also try to have uh, debug points placed so that we can see each and every step what's happening so now we need to decode the name uh, which we earlier encoded and sent to the name server so for that what we do is that we uh, start browsing through each byte i i know this code might not be optimized i think uh, a bunch of, there are a bunch of places where i can directly seek but uh, i'm just reading byte by byte uh, what i do first is that i read the entire length of the domain name if the length is zero as we if you remember we, when we were encoding it the last byte was zero so we just want to stop reading from the domain name as soon as we re reach that zero and uh, then what we do is that the name the domain name uh, might be in some cases compressed by dns because say if we enter a long uh, dns name then we're going to uh, then dns dns will compress it so it might be compressed sometimes and it might not be so just to know when is it compressed or not what we do is that we do a bitwise and uh, with double one uh, double zero double zero double zero so uh, that is something in I'm not able to okay i think we can do a simple calculation for getting what it's in decimal but once we do that and we get to know that the result is not zero it means the and operation returned a one then what we do is that we have another function to decode the compressed names and otherwise what we do is that uh, we just uh, read the bytes as it is and once that is done we uh, after appending each part after reading each part so what we do doing is that first we get to know that there is a 3 here and uh, now what we want to do is that seek 3 bytes because if you remember the previous just a second so say if we encoded the uh, domain name like this uh, what we need to do here is that first of all we get to know that there is a 3 we need to read 3 bytes we, so what we do is that Uh, our bytes buffer seeks uh, three places then it comes across another number and it gets to know that okay now i need to uh, seek eight places once so what we do is that we keep on appending a period after each seek so say if i seek uh, till api then i'll append a buffer and uh, then i'll append a period which becomes api dot then get simple dot and then uh, com so again going back to our function so here if you'll see i keep on appending uh, this period here to the domain name after adding the actual name and uh, once that is done since we'll be left with an extra period i i believe this code can be written in a better way but uh, for now since we have an extra period uh, at the end uh, we just strip it off so what we are uh, we just using we slicing the string here and uh, yeah so we we strip off the extra period from the end and now parsing the question which we already sent so uh, question is just basically a uh, question is also returned in the response so we are also passing the question to the dns question which we uh, had sent back again i'm using the same binary dot read and uh, saying that we want to encode uh, as the big decode into the big indian format and we pass a reference to uh, type and class and later on we also get the name here using the decode name function which we just wrote so that's completing the parsing of the question cool uh, now i think uh, we have a solid idea of what's going on and i think we can go hands on so i'll just keep this slide again for reference and i think now i'll jump into the code
so this is how uh, uh, the entry point to our application is uh, i'm sure that this can be evolved into a cli application and everything but uh, right now i've kept things simple uh, so say if you're querying for example.com as a domain and uh, we want to query for the record type a uh, then we call our resolver so i'll now dive into the details So uh, to resolve first, uh, what we do is that we have a root, num a root name server. I'll also show you what all the root name servers are available, just a second. So uh, iana.org has a list of uh, multiple root name servers uh, which uh, are open and we can query them for uh, a domain name. So one of them is this IP which you're seeing here, uh, 198.41.0.4. Uh, the internet is not working, otherwise I would have shown. Uh, there, there's a bunch of name servers. We can use any for starting because say if that name server doesn't have the information, it'll uh, end up redirecting us to some other name server which will have the information. And uh, yeah, so uh, what we do here is that, first of all, we try to build the query. So if you'll see, I have, I have uh, uh, debug points here, and uh, this is the information which we have right now. We want to query for the domain example.com, and we want to get the A record, and uh, we're hitting this name server. So now let's uh, build the query first. And for building the query, first of all, we want to encode the domain name. So we initialized a buffer, then we went ahead and uh, wrote the string and converted it into bytes. So if you'll see now the encoded uh, domain name, if I click on uh, viewing the buffer, if you'll see, it has the text, uh, is this visible? Uh, this is not uh, UTF-8 friendly, that's why it doesn't get rendered here properly, but if you'll see example and uh, com is here. So this is the exact domain name which you're trying to encode. And uh, the null byte is here so that the parser knows that it has to stop uh, decoding. Oh, uh, I need access to the internet because, yeah. So I had not handled the panic and uh, since there was no uh, internet connection, we were not able to reach the name server. So if you'll see, this is how it panics. If it is visible there, uh, network is unreachable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're ready with the query here. If you want, I'll uh, show you the DNS query. So this is the entire query. Uh, the only thing which is UTF-8 friendly is our domain name. So you'll see small example com written there. Otherwise it's all uh, byte data. Yeah, once that is done, uh, now we are into parsing a DNS response back. So uh, the reader gave us a huge response all in bytes. And now what we are doing is that we are uh, parsing the header first. 
and once we parse the header the header will tell us that how many questions how many answers how many authorities and it has and we'll iterate through each of them so that we get to know more information about that so if you'll see it returned us uh, a bunch of authorities here these authorities are again name servers so if you'll click on uh, just a second i think additionals will have that detail so if you'll see, uh, even the root name server returned us uh, an address to another name server. This is also uh, one of the name servers, gtld-servers.net. And if you'll see, we have a bunch of name servers like that. So what the root name server did was it didn't have the answer to the question. So it, it told that you might want to check these name servers as well. So if you'll see all these, uh, uh, have different name servers. That one had E as a prefix, this one has a B as a prefix. But again, uh, copies of uh, other name servers. So what our program right now is doing is that uh, since the root name server didn't have the answer to our question, it's uh, hitting the other name servers which it received and it keeps on hitting until uh, it resolves into an IP until it has, until we reach a name server, which has the answer to the question, which is example.com and it has a mapping to the IP. So if you'll see, uh, uh, this is how the console output looks like. Uh, we queried this name server, then other name server, and we keep on querying. So if you'll see, this is, th these are where uh, we are uh, querying each and every name server every time. I'll mute all the breakpoints so that we can quickly jump to the resolution. And once that is done, uh, we end up having an IP for example.com. Uh, we can verify this by firing dig. Yeah, so. so this is the list of root servers I was talking about. And uh, we are using the first one from here, operated by VeriSign. And uh, IANA has a bunch of name servers. And I think uh, it, it has a lot of uh, authorities as well. Uh, I don't know if this page has the information. Cool. Um, so. So if you'll see, uh, dig also returned us an answer section with the for the A record, uh, and this was the IP it uh, resolved to. Now let's see if our resolver is working properly. Yeah, the IP matches. So yeah, the resolver works fine. And uh, just to show you the interesting part where we, uh, because if you remember, just a second. So if you remember the client and server model, we just talked about a single name server here. But what happens in many cases and in most of the cases is that this name server would most probably not have an answer to our question. So multiple name servers are involved here. And what we do is that until and unless we receive uh, the answer as a A record and we, we keep on querying the name server. So I'll, I'll show you that piece of code. So this is the piece of code. Uh, what we do is that we keep on uh, uh, parsing through the response. So say if the record type is uh, name server, then we uh, keep on decoding the name. And uh, uh, like we, because we know that the name server type will not have the answer to our question. But once we, since right now I've not implemented the other uh, uh, DNS records, I have just added it into the default of the switch case. And, uh, but, but if there are other switch cases, uh, other records, so right now it doesn't have support for MX records and other records. If it has, what we can do is that we can have multiple case statements and the default could be once we get the answer. So yeah, this is, this is how it works. Yeah, I think, uh, that's pretty much it. And, uh,
this is how you can build your own simple uh, DNS resolver. Uh, any questions? And I'm happy to answer. Question. Good. I'll, I'll give the mic before and then ask my question next. Uh, how many name servers do you go through before saying that it's an invalid domain name? Uh, I think right now the program doesn't handle that. Uh, it will end up, uh, until and unless it, it doesn't get a response, it will uh, end up panicking, I think. If you want, we can try with an invalid domain name also. Let's see what happens. Okay. Yeah. So this list of name servers, uh, is it all name servers in the world or is it like a cluster that you have uh, like uh, configured? Uh, I didn't get your question. Sorry, uh, so the uh, list of name servers that you're going through, right? <coughs> Okay, this one in the code. Yeah, yeah, so have you configured to go through these specifically or is it? No, no, no. So this is the response which we're getting from the root name server. So if you'll see, I'll just fire the program once again. Okay. Understood. So the response of one gives you the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you'll see the additional sections here, it has a bunch of... So it returned 10 records. So one of these 10 might have the answer to our question or else uh, once we finish uh, parsing through these, it might have redirected us to more name servers and one of them might have the answer. So if you'll see, I'll just open the name of each. So are you able to see this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is what I'm browsing through and let's experiment that as well. Even I haven't tried an invalid domain name. Oh, so the program keeps on querying the name servers and uh, since we do not get an answer, it just ends up in a, uh, ends up in an infinite loop, I think. Right. Yeah. But, uh, oh, it will not be an infinite loop because ultimately we'll ex uh, exhaust the, the list of name servers. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, this has ended execution. But yeah, this is something, uh, yeah, I should break once after I've exhausted all the name servers. That's true. Of that operator or? All, literally all name servers. No, so if, uh, like, so it's, it's this, this whole entire mapping is like a tree. Uh, all these root name servers are just multiple entry points to the same tree. So if one, if I'm not getting the answer from one of the root no the name server, I really believe that the others might not also have. Got but it. yeah, the program can be enhanced by adding support, querying all the root name servers for reliability. Yeah. Thanks. Hey man, hi. So there's a point in your program where you've already decoded the header and then you go ahead and uh, spin up several iterations on the additionals and the questions and answers. Yeah. yeah. Any reason why you chose to skip uh, using go routines there as that would like enhance your... Yes, that would definitely do that. But I just wanted to keep it very simple. I mean, the learning was mostly about... Uh, how I can translate bytes into DNS headers, DNS questions, and build all of this together to build a DNS packet, and then parse multiple DNS packets to get the final answer. So you're right, I think uh, if you use GoRoutines there, definitely it could speed up. But we'll have to handle concurrent writes to the byte buffer because uh, we are sharing the same byte buffer there. So that's one more thing. Any other questions? Hi, Now, my question is about performance of this. Uh, so you said that this code base was already there, uh, say, in Python, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and when we made it equivalent in Go, uh, Go mm -hmm. does it have a difference in terms of, say, avoid network latency mm -hmm. of resolving? But if I have, say, uh, say 10 million records which I want to resolve it, mm -hmm. what uh, will be the best language for me in this use case? Uh... I'm not sure, I might not have the answer to this question. I'm not sure what would be the most performant. But uh, again, as I said, the aim of the entire thing was to just understand how I can translate bytes into actual meaningful data. But 
I mean, it is really depends on the implementation. I don't think uh, I, there can be one answer that which is the most performant. But yeah, we can run benchmarks and arrive to one final conclusion. That's there. That's definitely there. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the the dig so the, the Unix utility, which uh, I think that uh, that is written in C, the Linux utility which comes. Okay. I'll just check the man page as well. In, in terms of suppose I want to save this data into files and all, right? Whether Go will be faster or? Uh, and also to add uh, to what Himanshu said, if you're wondering uh, that uh, our user program will uh, like iteratively go through all name servers, that doesn't happen in real life. What happens in real life is that, uh, so we were talking about this user program resolver and the name server. What happens is that there's a cache which sits in between. So the DNS cache, like the your host system will ca keep, like uh, have some data cached. Similarly, uh, you'll, you'll not need to go to the root name server, uh, some nearest, like uh, a name server near to you might have already cached the data. So, I mean, uh, th this is one thing which is used to make uh, user programs and uh, domain name query more faster, like having a cache. But uh, having a cache also has its own uh, problems. We have uh, things like DNS cache poisoning where someone can poison your DNS cache and end up, and you end up redirecting to something entirely different. Thank you. And this is the original RFC, by the way. Uh, 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 hi. So here. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that will this work as a local DNS resolver also? Uh, I mean, if I want to get the IP address of the same PC, will this work? Of the same. PC, I didn't Usually we use net package, right? Net dot lookup IP or lookup host. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. with this D DNS resolver, we will be able to do that task. Yeah, yeah. so even net dot lookup will have its own DNS resolution implementation. And yeah. uh, this is also, I mean, I'm sure that implementation will be far better than what this is. But yeah, you can, uh, in your programs, when you're trying, you could, uh, so if you'll see the entry point, it has, uh, yeah, maybe you, we could have this as a package and you could use this for IP resolution. It's okay. doing the same thing. So if you'll see uh, the final response is IP. Mm -hmm. So if you're so just talking about resolving IP and just A records, because right now the support is there only for A records, this should work. Okay, so in that case, domain name won't have .com or something like that. We'll just have host name. So it will work? Why would the domain name not have .com? Uh, because the same computer in which we are uh, getting that IP address, right? So okay, got it. So you're talking about domain name resolution on a local network. Oh, on a local network. So right. domain name resolution on a local network might, so how it works is that I think the router handles this part. Uh, you have DHCP which will set dynamic IP, but uh, even in a local setup, first of all, you'll have to have something. I think. Uh, the uh, router gateway which we have, if we hit mm -hmm. it, it should have uh, information. But again, I okay. mean, uh, you'll still not have a domain name in your local network. That's the multicast yeah, MDNS is also, multicast DNS is also there. Like it will uh, okay. send uh, DNS queries to all the other uh, devices in the network. Okay. That's the s uh, simplified version, right? Yeah. Cool, cool. Got it. Thank you. But I'm still not sure if you'll be uh, able to resolve a local uh, domain name yeah, on a local network. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that question. No problem. 
But yeah, yeah that, that's maybe an exercise for you to try. Good. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So um, earlier in the in the part where you were decoding the header, yeah, yeah. there was a bitwise operation between the length and other operator. Yeah, yeah. Is there a significance why you chose that operator? Yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll uh, show you the original uh, blog. So this is the blog which I followed. Uh, it was. Uh, written by Julia Evans and uh, the original implementation is in Python. Um, so what it does, this was the struct dot pack I was mentioning. Uh, even this is a great read. Uh, if you're curious, more curious, you can actually go and read this. So here's the explanation for uh, your question. What we do is that we do that bin bitwise and operation to get to know if the first two bits are ones. That's what I remember. Oh yes. Uh, what we do is that uh, if if we if the and operation returns a zero, it means the first two bits are not set to one because a bitwise and between one and zero will return zero. But if those two first bits are set as one, then the res the uh, operation result would be one. So if you if you remember that check is also uh, the same. It checks for yeah. It checks for uh, a non-zero value here. So once uh, we get to know that we uh, we come to know that the name which we want to decode is a compressed uh, DNS name. So we should. Uh, call another function to decode the compressed name. So, yeah. Okay, wait. It says over here in a normal DNS name part, the top two bits will never be set. Does that mean that it will be 00 in a normal DNS? So, won't it be like 001? The two bits will never be set. Yeah, that's true, right? In a normal DNS, you'll have the first two bits as zero. So, do you? Perform bitwise and with with one one as in the other operand that has the one one at the beginning. Yeah, I mean if you'll see, uh, this has one one in the beginning. Yes. And also um, in the in 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 the screen uh, on the right hand side as in yeah here. Yeah. So it queries the first IP address. Mm -hmm. For the names of ones, for the domain name ones, mm -hmm. and then it queries the other IP address mm -hmm. multiple times. Why mm -hmm. is that? So uh, what happened here is that the root name server didn't have the answer to the question, and it redirected to the other no name server. the The other name server had, I think, ten uh, authorities to check for. So it's probably pinging the other ten. In the root server, there's only one authority. Uh, if you let, let's just check that by starting the debugger. I think these all are the same. So if you'll see, this is also the same name server. And I think this is because this is an, okay, it has the other name server also. Yeah, it pro probably the code didn't handle the other records. That's why it's only sticking to one. So yeah, this is something which I did not uh, expect, like an hand handling an invalid domain name. Yeah, but that can be considered as an improvisation to the program. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? And if you're uh, more curious, uh, do read uh, this blog. I uh, really loved reading it, and maybe you can implement it in a language of your own choice. So, yeah. Our next talk, we will have Madhav and Raghav. So, hey.
mic test. Everyone Check. can hear. Great. Okay. Um, I'm just going to get this chair out of the way. Okay. So, um, can we use eBPF to debug performance of the Go scheduler, right? This isn't a question that we are asking in a clever way to say that, oh, here's a battle tested way to actually go ahead and do it and we have done it. This is an actual question. We have no idea if you can do this. So this talk hopes to explore further possibilities in that area. So who are we, right? Uh, my name is Madhav. I work at VMware. Um, I work uh, as my day job. I work on the Kubernetes project where I do work in API machinery, uh, architecture, scalability, and contributor experience. I'm also one of the maintainers for the project and a tech lead in the community. Raghav. Hi, uh, I'm Raghav Roy. I work here at VMware with the NSX data path team. And uh, when it comes to Go, I think uh, most of my work goes into uh, the Kubernetes project, say Contribex. I try to do it as much as I can, but yeah. Great. So uh, disclaimer, uh, talk is going to be full of disclaimers, by the way. So, you know, uh, take it how you will. So are we eBPF experts? No. Are we experts in the history and implementation of the Go runtime? No. Uh, are we experts in the Linux kernel? No. So why the hell are we even here? Like, oh, why, you, why would you want to attend this talk? Um, the minimum takeaway is internals on the performance of the Go scheduler, how it does things, why it does things the way that it does. And um, if you're feeling dangerously adventurous, some ideas to explore around optimizing latency at the OS scheduler level. Um, so this talk, right now at least, uh, we put this together in a span of two days. So for now, it's look, it's look for solutions, searching for a problem. Not sure if the problem still exists, but maybe for you it does, and this is something for you to explore. Great, so uh, another disclaimer, everything discussed here um, is in reference to the latest Go version that's out there, which is 1.20.6. Okay, so uh, hi, yeah, so I'll be covering the eBPF section of the talk, uh, but before we get into that, uh, as users or as developers, uh, when you interact with your machine, you generally don't interact with the kernel directly. You, uh, so we don't really know what goes under, uh, under the hood. So stuff like standard libraries and shell commands abstract away uh, all the kernel processes that are happening. Um, and we're all gen basically blissfully unaware of all that goes on in, in your kernel. Uh, to drive this point home, let's see what a simple echo call uh, uh, internally, the syscalls that a simple echo call can trigger. And for this, we run an S-trace. So an echo, you know, will, own, will accept a uh, value or a text and just print it out uh, to the STD out. So how many would you guess? More than 100 syscalls which, for just an echo. Uh, I invite you to try any style command that you want. Uh, try an S-trace on it and see what's going on uh, in your kernel. So we can learn a lot uh, about how an application behaves if we can see its interaction uh, in its kernel. Say you have, an ex uh, you have an application that opens a bunch of files uh, and you want to trace, uh, you want to see if this file is opening, uh, if this application is only opening files uh, that it has access to or it should be opening, uh, how would you do that? Maybe you can modify the kernel. Uh, output something when an event occurs in the kernel, say a syscall, right? So whenever the application triggers an F open, whatever syscalls are associated with that, uh, capture it, output something into the user space. That might not be a great idea. First of all, the Linux kernel is extremely complex. Uh, but assume that's not a problem that you have. Assume that you are a, a, a kernel engineer. That isn't the only problem. Say you come up with an approach, you develop it, you have it accepted into the Linux kernel, which by the way takes months and not all your patches are gonna get accepted uh, into the kernel. Uh, and even after a kernel version has your patch, it's not like all the Linux distros are gonna have uh, the kernel version running on day one. For example, Debian or Ubuntu take years to come to uh, a kernel version that's just released. 
So by the time your Linux distro or your favorite Linux distro adopts that kernel version, your requirements might have changed. And this is illustrated really well in this comic. Uh, there's this application developer. He wants a feature. Uh, he takes a year to develop it and get it into the kernel. Five years later, your Linux distribution now ships with the kernel, but by then your requirements have changed. Enter eBPF. Now, a uh, few things to get right out of the back. So the Linux kernel can accept kernel modules to extend its behavior. I won't go too much into it, but basically you can write kernel modules, compile it with your kernel, and uh, have it extend what the kernel can already do. Uh, but is this safe? What happens if your kernel, uh, if your module crashes? It, it's running inside the kernel. Uh, it's running in a privileged space. Uh, if it crashes, it brings down your entire system. Uh, plus, you need to compile it with the kernel and you need to reboot your machine. But eBPF programs can be loaded safely and dynamically into the kernel and do just this. This, again, uh, the application developer in this case talks to the eBPF developer and they come up, they can rapidly prototype an eBPF program and they have the program ready to go and you don't even need to reboot your machine. So, caveats. What happens if your eBPF program crashes, right? It's the same thing. It's running in the kernel space. Um, if it crashes, it can bring down the entire system. Is it safe to run? Uh, since it has access to a lot of privileged data, set, uh, data structures, and it uh, can also view all the events that uh, are happening in your kernel, it can be potentially used to snoop around and get information that you don't want it to have. Here is where the eBPF verifier kicks in. We, uh, I won't be covering a lot uh, in detail, but it's a great thing to read upon. Uh, but basically what it does is that it makes sure that uh, the program exits safely and only accesses memory that it's supposed to access. Still, uh, if when you're running eBPF programs, you should make sure that it's from verifiable sources. If you're still not convinced that eBPF is a, is a better solution for this, uh, for this problem that I mentioned, uh, they can be loaded and removed dynamically. It doesn't matter if your application was already running. Uh, it instantly gets visibility over everything that's happening in the machine, and you can create new functionality very quickly without all the Linux users having to accept the changes. Okay, so we agree that this is great, but how does it work? Uh, before we get into uh, the, the entire flow of writing an eBPF program and loading it into the kernel, uh, let's start with some components. Let's start with how you would write an eBPF program. Now, the kernel accepts programs in a, a bytecode format or an object file. Uh, and for this reason, you can't write eBPF programs written in high-level languages, but because not uh, all of them have uh, this, the, the compilers will not have the capability to emit bytecode. Uh, like I said, not all languages support this. Languages that support this uh, are C and Rust. Uh, even when you're writing it in C, you have to write it in like a restricted C. Uh, you can't have runtime features that run in the user space running in the kernel space. Uh, for example, you have the Go garbage collection or the Go scheduling, which is relevant to this talk. Uh, th those are the reasons we can't write eBPF programs in high level languages. So coming to events, we already talked about a type of event already. We talked about syscalls, but what other events exist in the kernel? But before that, eBPF programs are event driven. When an event occurs uh, in the kernel that the eBPF program is uh, attached to, it triggers the eBPF program and it does whatever you have designed it to do. Once it's loaded into the kernel, it needs to be attached to an event. We've already talked about syscalls. Uh, syscalls are basically stable APIs that don't change with kernel versions. And so they're great places to hook your eBPF program into because you wouldn't need to require your eBPF, uh, maintain your eBPF uh, program that much. Uh, another uh, interesting place where you can attach your eBPF program is function entry and exit points within the kernel. So for example, uh, if you have, if you talk about the network stack, you can have stuff like packet receive, packet uh, dispatch, and whenever the kernel enters and exits these functions, you can uh, attach your eBPF program to something called K probes. These are function entry points and K return probes, which are function exit points. Uh, they're now called F entry and F exit, which are basically uh, a more efficient way of um, efficient implementation in newer kernel versions. Uh, this can also be hooked into user space programs called U probes and U return probes, similarly. 
network's interface hook. So using Express Data Path, uh, it basically makes your Linux network stack programmable, and you can attach your eBPF programs into stuff like the uplink, if you're running in a virtualized environment, maybe the virtual switch, ports, uh, get stuff like packet, metrics, traffic. Uh, you can attach it to perf events, trace points. Basically, there is a vast variety and amount of places that you can hook your eBPF program into, and this starts to give you an impression of just how powerful uh, eBPF program can be. You can use it to make your network more efficient or uh, increase performance, stuff like that. You said something about maps. Yes, I did. Maps are very important. Uh, they are a very important concept in eBPF programming in general. But what they are basically are key, pa key values uh, pairs and data structures that are used by both the user space program that loads the eBPF program into your kernel and the eBPF program itself. Uh, they are defined alongside uh, the eBPF programs and are loaded into the kernel with it. The, how the user space program uses the map is that it writes configs like event registration into them. So the events that the eBPF program needs to attach to and uh, get triggered by are written with these maps. Uh, and what, why, so when the eBPF program gets loaded into the kernel, it can read from these maps and configure itself to the right events. Both the user space and the kernel space program need to have a common understanding of the data structure stored in the map because they're using uh, that common space. So now you know the basics uh, of the components that go into running an eBPF program. Congratulations. Uh, let's visualize the flow of uh, an eBPF program being loaded into the kernel and it reacting to events. So this diagram is loading the eBPF program into the kernel. You have an, uh, a user space program which can load the eBPF programs and the maps uh, by using BPF syscalls, these, these are special syscalls, to load your uh, bytecode, which is compiled by, uh, say, the CLang compiler, uh, into the kernel. The eBPF verifier runs on this bytecode and basically checks it out to be safe to run in your kernel space. Then your just-in-time compiler uh, compiles it into native code, and now it can run in your kernel. The eBPF also reads from the map uh, all the event configurations that the user space writes using uh, the similar uh, BP, BPF syscalls uh, and configure itself to the right events. Now, what happens when an event that the eBPF program is, is attached to gets triggered? It uh, triggers the eBPF, and whatever you've designed your eBPF program to do, say, collect information, packet data, uh, it writes all that information into the map, and the user space program can now uh, use syscalls to read from this map all the information that the eBPF has collected, your program has collected. And then you can do whatever you want in these user space program with it. For example, if it's an observability thing, you can draw graphs uh, of the shape of the traffic at the port. Uh, types of events, yeah. So we've already mentioned the types of events. Um, K probes, XDP events, perf events, you can attach your eBPF uh, program into all of these. So you got the flow. Uh, things not mentioned, but provided resources to. These are things that I couldn't cover, but something that you should definitely check out, especially if you want to start off with uh, tinkering around with eBPF programs and how to uh, write them. The BCC toolkit is a great place to start. They already have sample programs written, um, and you can just load them into your kernel using user space programs and then uh, have fun with that. The libraries also have a bunch of helper functions that are already uh, existing. Uh, so you, won't, you, would, you don't need to write her, these uh, helper functions yourself to capture events that trigger the eBPF program. They already exist for most cases, and they are something that we use in our demo as well. Uh, another big point, uh, another big thing that eBPF uh, solves is portability. So, it's, uh, the, it's a great advantage that eBPF has, which means that you can write an eBPF program uh, in one place and have it run on any kernel version. This is difficult because every kernel version will have slight differences in how they define the data structure or where the kernel entry and exit points are. So compile once, run everywhere is the philosophy. Um, and how it works, I have attached resources to. Please check that out. Yeah, that's from me. Um, so I just wanted to pause a little bit here. Himanshu, you mentioned we have 10 minutes in the end for questions. Yeah.
can we split that up during the talk? Because yeah. I'm realizing it's sort of a dense talk. It's going to get much denser as we go on. So for EBPF, we can spend maybe two minutes on questions right now itself so that you know we are clear while we go ahead. Uh, at least based on the, in the great intro that Raghav gave. Does anyone have questions to start off with? Uh, just one question here that uh, this use case, right? What is the use case for which uh, uh, people may end up writing EBBF? Why we have to modify the kernel to bring any, uh, if you can throw some light on the use cases for which people may use. So one use case, I mean, one toy use case I've already mentioned in the start, the application where you want to see, uh, the uh, program where you want to see if an application is opening files that it has access to, for example and not doing anything else as malicious. But another place, uh, right off the top of my head, uh, eBPF is used a lot in uh, network, uh, increasing your network performance or uh, packet filtering for security purposes. So it can capture packets at these uh, networks hook, network hooks that I mentioned. And uh, you can strip away its headers and uh, see where the packet needs to go, what the content of the packet is, and drop it or route it, reroute it, depending on uh, what you want to do. So security, if, uh, I know, I, I can't give you an example, but I know that a lot of optimizations uh, in your user space programs uh, can be achieved if you can get relevant data uh, from eBPF running in your kernel. Yeah, I can add on to that. So there's a really hot space right now called continuous profiling, uh, which is basically you are constantly running profiling on your deployment getting um, information about what function is running for how long and what the call stack looks like, stuff like that. The problem with continuous profiling is to enable it, you would need to change your program itself. Um, you need to add in uh, stuff like hooks that, okay, profile this function, get out this data, stuff like that. But uh, what innovation now that's being done using eBPF is there is zero instrumentation profiling. So um, you can use perf to get all of these uh, event data, uh, performance event data and uh, traces. You can use eBPF to read these perf events and then do a bunch of stuff um, that you would like. So one example is observability, right? Uh, you can get very fine-grained access to uh, things. So Raghav mentioned security. So you can get very fine-grained access to what container is making what system calls. If you don't want it to make that system call, what do you do with it? So stuff like that. So um, it's a, it's a nice flexible space to be in. Yeah, um, we can, okay, one more question and we'll move on. Over there. Then if you can enable dynamic uh, kernel tracing and like he had mentioned that you, ca you can add U probes and uh, you know, you can tie it into uh, user space uh, programs into that. So you can actually enable uh, HIDS, uh, host-based intrusion detection system is what he was talking about. You, you can, I think you can extend it to be a host-based intrusion prevention system as well uh, in, in future. That's so a really good point, yeah. Thanks for that. One more question and we'll continue. Okay. Hey, hi. So essentially it uh, works on the kernel events which are exposed by kernel, right? Uh, and uh, ABF reads to that or listens to those events which are explicitly uh, exposed by kernel. So is it that ABF is also working on, uh, only ABF is able to or have permission to listen to this kernel or I can create my own program uh, which is out, which is in the user space and I can also listen to my those events and create my own ABF. Yeah, that's the main uh, advantage of it. You can do it and you can define your own events as well. So, uh, for example, if you enter a system call, uh, you can define a probe which says, as soon as I enter this system call function in the kernel, perform this set of logic, and based on this logic, output an event for me to read later on. So you can uh, get information such as thread IDs that are receiving certain system calls, which is what we'll see soon, and we'll tie that back into the Go scheduler as well, and stuff like that. So it's meant for like custom uh, definitions. Did you mean that n not using eBPF? Uh -huh, not using eBPF. Yeah, I mean, so eBPF provides a great framework for you to do it okay. because there's a lot that goes into it. But sure, it's if, if they're able to do it, you can do it also. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to capture events that are happening in the, uh, uh, in the kernel space or even in the user space, uh, 
I'm not sure how you would do it, but I'm sure it's possible. Uh, so, so if you don't want to use eBPF, there is, uh, at least in Linux, there is a tracing subsystem that exists. Uh, you can use the tracing subsystem to get similar information. So EBF basically is powering uh, or giving me an interface to execute things efficiently rather than going inside and look, uh, listen to each and every event. It just gives me interface to do that. Yeah, you can define custom events essentially. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, great, moving on. Um, why are we here, why do we care part two, right? Go routines, so this is Go Bangalore. Um, we are here to talk about Go. Go routines, uh, if you've used Go, a lot of us really, really appreciate the concurrency primitives of Go. So Go routines, they're quote unquote lightweight threads, they're not threads, don't quote me on this. Uh, they're managed by the Go runtime, which we'll see soon. And it has a super minimal API that it exposes that you can use and it just does its thing. So it's just the keyword Go. So we'll try visualizing stuff a little bit. Um, so a little bit, uh, the next part of this talk is a subset of the talk I had given earlier on. So if you want more details into the internals of the scheduler, feel free to check this out. Um, so let's take a small example, right? Let's say we have a small program, which is go do something and then do another thing. So go do something fires off a go routine, do another thing, just creates another function call and it does something with it. Um, we build it and our app logically contains of the, consists of the following parts now. We have the application code and we have the go runtime. The application code typically calls into the Go runtime. And when I say calls into the Go runtime, this is what it might look like. So when I compile this program, it gets compiled into a runtime function called runtime.newproc. This is what is used to create a new Go routine. So this is one example of how your application Go code might call into the Go runtime. Um, and then you have your underlying operating system and the Go runtime interfaces with the underlying operating system. And this is where uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Um, so let's actually run our code, right? Uh, in our code, we might have a bunch of Go routines. We will denote Go routines by G. Um, this, all of the Go routines are in user space. We might have a bunch of threads uh, in the kernel space. We'll denote those by the square boxes titled M. So G and M are notations of Go routines and threads in the Go runtime. And finally, we have our hardware, which is operating system codes, right? Uh, this is what actually runs our code. So uh, threads might are scheduled onto the operating system cores using the uh, kernel scheduler, uh, might be CFS, might be real-time scheduling, batch scheduling, what have you. And now we need to figure out the upper part of the picture. How do we get the Go routines that are in the user space to actually run our code, right? So how do we do that? So we need some way to map Go routines to operating system threads. And this is what is known as user space scheduling. So um, skipping ahead a few approaches that could have been taken but weren't, Go uses something called NM scheduling, which is you have multiple Go routines in the user space and the Go scheduler schedules them onto multiple Go routines in the kernel space. Um, how do we keep track of Go routines, right? Because in order to run something, we need to know there is something to run in the first place. So uh, queues, and this isn't much of a surprise because the kernel scheduler uses queues heavily, most schedulers use queues heavily. Um, so one model of the queue uh, could be, you could have a distributed uh, scheduler, right? I'm saying distributed right now because I'm not providing a bunch of context earlier on. So go 1.0 had a centralized scheduler which had just one global queue. The problem with that is you have a bunch of threads accessing it through a lock and it's not scalable. So later on it was distributed out. So you might have something which looks like this. You have a global run queue and then each thread has local individual run queues that keeps track of the go routines to run. Um, the problem with this is a bunch of Go routines can be blocked on system calls. So that thread is essentially unusable. So if a bunch of threads are unusable, do we still need to maintain per thread metadata in terms of run queues? That might not scale well because you might have an arbitrarily large number of threads and you might have a memory uh, blow up that might happen. So uh, how do we get past this? We use indirection as most problems in computer science, right? Um, so the indirection we use is something called uh, processor or P. So this is going to be denoted by uh, the circle with P. So this is also the denotation in the Go runtime as well. Uh, the number of processors is equal to the value of Go max procs, as you might be aware. Um, so you have P, uh, the processor has a thread associated with it, and each processor now has a local run queue. So now we've limited and bounded the number of, the amount of metadata we keep track of. 
and uh, this gives us far more flexibility. So we have, uh, and now the thread runs the GoRoutine. Great. So this is what our scheduler now finally looks like, right? Assume a world where GoMax proxies two. We have two processors, each on its own local run queue. We have a thread associated with the processor. Thread runs the GoRoutine, and we also have a global run queue. Um, so Dmitry Vyukov is the original author of the new modified, scalable, decentralized, uh, Go distributed, not decentralized, Go scheduler. So he's given a talk on way more design details, and he goes into stuff like stack splitting and how that affects scheduling and stuff like that. So the ambition is a million Go routines with a highly scalable scheduler. And it's achieving just that. So it's a really, really cool thing to watch. Uh, so before we move forward, let's look at what no the notion of fairness is. Um, in scheduling in general, you might encounter something known as the convoy effect. Essentially, you might have one task which is extremely long running. And if you let that task run on, the other tasks will starve off that resource. You, you aren't giving a chance to the other task um, to get that resource. So this is a common problem in dealing with fairness in scheduling algorithms as a whole. So there are, on, in general, over a broad spectrum of things, there are two ways you can deal with this. You can have cooperative preemption, which is you say that, you know what, I trust this long running process is going to give up the resource in a timely manner. And uh, if it does, I'm just going to keep trusting it. I'm going to wait for a little bit. I'm not going to do anything about it. Or you can have non-cooperative pre uh, preemption, which is if the long running resource runs for too long, it can say that, okay, you know what, you've exhausted your time slice. I'm going to cut you off right there. Feel free to re resume later on. So that's non-cooperative preemption. Um, great. Before we move forward, we have like a bunch of queues here, right? How do we even pick what Go routine to run? So summarizing that uh, algorithm a little bit, you first check your local run queue. If you have work in the local run queue, run it from that. Now, if your local run queue is empty, uh, check the global run queue and still work from that. Now, if the global run queue is also empty, there is a component in the runtime called the net polar, which helps out with asynchronous IO operations um, that Go helps with, and this is really, really, this is one of the key things to why uh, Go web servers are really scalable. Um, if the net polar also doesn't have work for us, we still work from another processor. Um, so this is how it goes. And it's actually a little more involved than this. Like there are, stuff, there, is, there are things like the global run queue is checked at a random number 61. Like if the scheduler passes 60, the 61st time of the scheduling pass, it'll be like, okay, I'm gonna like chuck all of this. I'm gonna check the global run queue. And there's a really, really interesting reason for this. Um, we can talk more about that later. Uh, so what about the convoy effect, right, that we spoke about? Will that be taken care of? So trip down memory lane. Uh, Go 1.0 did purely cooperative preemption. That is, it was like, I'm going to trust this hot loop here that it will eventually give up, and my system won't starve of resources, which obviously wasn't uh, ideal. Then Go 1.2 was like, OK, you know what? We can do something a little better. Uh, we'll do compiler baked in preemption, or what is known as function call preemption. So what happens is, whenever a function call takes place, the compiler inserts preemption checks right at the beginning of that function call. So if a preemption check passes, the runtime then preempts that go routine. The problem here is the compiler might optimize code and inline that function altogether. So you don't have a function call to begin with. You're back with the same hot loop. So there's not a lot you can do here. Finally, in Go 1.14, we got non-cooperative preemption. Um, every 10 milliseconds, a go routine will be tried to be preempted. It's best effort preemption. It's not guaranteed because you can't always preempt a go routine. Uh, there are safe points at which you can preempt it. So there's 10 milliseconds. And the way it does it is it sends user space signals to the thread that is running this long running Go routine. And the signal it sends is SIGERD. This might seem like a really random thing, which no one has heard of. At least I didn't hear of it until I learned about it. It might seem like a really random thing, but there is a really, really, really beautiful reason as to why that's done. And that's by uh, the lead of the Go runtime and compilers team, Austin Clements. That talk is really good if you want to check it out. Um, so who sends this signal, right? You have a daemon in the runtime called Sysmon. Um, it sees that, okay, this Go routine has been running for more than 10 milliseconds. I'm, go I'm gonna try and preempt it. So it sends a signal to the thread that is running this Go routine for more than 10 milliseconds. So where does the preempted Go routine go? Once it gets preempted, it gets put on the global run queue. B essentially because as you remember, global run queue is checked later down in the list. 
So you're saying that, you know what, you've run for too long, you can't go back in the first priority over here. I mean, priority, there's no notion of priority in the scheduler, but for a lack of better term. Um, yeah, awesome. So we now have a kind of sort of good idea about what happens under the hood. All this is taken care of by the runtime itself. Are there, but are there knobs that the runtime provides us with to interact with the scheduler specifically? There are runtime APIs that give us this. So a long recommendation from the Go team is try and treat the runtime as a black box as much as possible. Now we are going to disregard that recommendation today and we're going to tear open that black box and see what's inside. Whether it's a good idea or not, uh, don't quote me on that. It's up to you, but at least it's cool. So we learn something new. Um, it's a good thing that there, are no, there aren't a lot of knobs exposed because it's really intricate what happens in the runtime. And your understanding of it for your use case might not align with the best intent of what the runtime is trying to do for you. So whatever is available should be understood. Uh, there are a bunch of APIs that the runtime provides us with. So num go routine, go max props, go shared, go exit, and lock OS thread. We are going to try and talk about lock OS thread and lock OS thread today. These ones, um, there is great documentation on it. I have linked that. You can also check out the talk that I have linked earlier on. You can, it's there in that as well. Uh, detailed explanation. Uh, go max props has some performance benefits, so you might want to take a look into that. Not performance benefits, performance penalties. Sorry. So lock OS thread, unlock OS thread, right? This is what it does. It wires the calling go routine to the underlying operating system thread. So this is meant to be used when the go routine is changing the thread state in some way. So one great example of this is if you're developing GUI applications using Go. So if you're using OpenGL, for example, OpenGL might change the thread context, the underlying thread context. And if your Go routine is depending on this changed thread context, and it gets scheduled onto another thread because of preemption, because of work stealing, because of whatever, your Go routine might not function properly because that thread state is not changed. So this is what that looks like, right? You're depending on a changed thread state, which is denoted by the star. Uh, let's say a new thread is created and it's, sch it's scheduled onto that. Now your Go routine might not work properly. So um, Vworks has an excellent case study on this. They, had, they, run in, they ran into a very tricky production issue. So this is a great, great way to like, learn more about the internals. So looking at the fine print of these two functions, right? So it sort of acts like a taint. So it taints the thread that it calls into. So when it taints it, no Go routine can be scheduled onto this thread until unlock OS thread is called that many number of times. And no thread can be created from a locked thread. So there are a few, there's a few there's some logic in the runtime, which warrants a creation of a new thread. Uh, that's also like really interesting. So, but we don't have time to cover that here. So don't and we don't create. It's recommended to not create go routines from that locked go routine, because if that go routine is created, there is no guarantee that that go routine uh, will not be scheduled on another thread. It can be scheduled on another thread as well. And if, you, if that state dependency is still there, you're still in that same. A messy situation. So if a go routine exits before unlocking the thread, the thread has gotten rid of and we don't reuse that thread at all in the, in the scheduler. The last point is important for our demo, so I just want to like call that out. Um, so where does EVPF come in? Yeah, so we already talked about how the Go runtime that's running in the user space uh, talks to the operating system and this is done by using syscalls. And like I discussed in my talk, this is a great place to attach your ABPF program into. Uh, this was a slide, uh, if you remember. Uh, the SIGR call preempts the thread, and ABPF can capture these SIGR calls to see uh, which thread is being preempted. Great. So demo time, right? <laughs> so um, disclaimer part two. Okay, actually, you know what? We'll stop for three minutes of questions. Any questions? Three minutes. A question from yeah. the slide that was shown earlier. So um, I think it was related to the scheduler uh -huh. um, and, and sort of like how it checks. No, not this one. Oh, the uh, picking of board routine? Yeah, uh, and how it checks which thread or oh, which, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. So in the last thing, steal work in bulk from another process. That yeah. P stands for processor, right? Yes, 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 P stands for processor. Another processor, so you have a number of Ps, right? So let's say if your GoMax Prox is four, you can have four Ps. So if P number zero does not have work and none of the other things have work, it'll pick a P at random 
uh, to and steal half of its workload for itself. Right, yeah. but how would have how would it have like context from another processor? Uh, so the the runtime implement the processor is basically a slice in the runtime. So if you check that okay, I don't have any work anywhere else. You just iterate for the slice, pick a random index. Uh, say random index is two. So p of two, check if that has work. So the processor is a struct itself. So that has more information inside it saying, okay, these are the go routines I'm keeping track of. These are the threads I've interacted with. This is my memory cache. So it has context of all that inside p. So once it accesses p itself, it has information about everything else. Okay. Yep. Great. Any more questions? Uh, when you talked about uh, 10ms sort of soft limit, right? Yeah. And it goes back to the global yeah. uh, runtime. It can be there forever, right? Can go again in the loop there. Uh, That's why it's 61. 61, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, global run queue is checked every 61st iteration of the scheduler to ensure that doesn't happen. So th the 61 is a measure to ensure fairness hmm. in the scheduler. And 61 is a prime number. number four. So you don't check it too often. Hmm. You just check it often enough. Got it. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay, let's move on. So the demo part, right? Huh. I really like this. I really like this gopher, by the way. It's so cute. But uh, demo part, right? Disclaimer part two. Um, the demo that we're going to show, you might not even, it might not be representative of any application. So what we're going to do is we're going to lock a bunch of go routines to a bunch of threads and we're going to try and simulate the OpenGL type of thing we talked about but ideally this should be a long running scenario but since we didn't have time to hack up a more sophisticated demo we're going to try and simulate that so what we're going to do is actually you know what let me show the demo um, yeah okay so we have our EVPF program which is heavily inspired from uh, this already existing BCC tool called Killsnoop, so which essentially tracks kill signals being sent. Um, so it's heavily inspired from that. So now what we do is we write our eBPF program. So we have, uh, we define a value struct, which is what we're going to get information from. We are going to define a data struct which is what we're going to use as the event to send back. And you have, you see here, sys called T3 kill. So when we, you, when we send a SIGURG signal, right? When the runtime sends a SIGURG signal, it uses a sys called TG kill. So now we want to attach a K probe for a sys call called TG kill. So that's the format to do it in. So sys call underscore underscore. Newer, newer versions of EPBF have it done in a different way, but this was like maybe a year back. So underscore underscore TG kill. And that's the function, the signature of the function. And all signature of the function is prefixed by a context which has like BPF register and stuff like that. So uh, we do that. And that's the most important part, sig not equal to 23. So all system calls, all signals, user space signals have a code. Sig kill, for example, that you might know of is code nine. You do kill hyphen nine, which is sig kill. SIGGERG has a code of 23. So if the signal code is not 23, we don't want this event at all. Don't care about it, move on. But if it is 23, uh, we do a bunch of stuff, like getting the command name, which we will soon see, and updating that key into a BPF map. So the key is what is the key of the our event in the BPF map. And finally, we have the return. So Return from the system call is a kernel return probe. So you do k rex is tg kill. Uh, tg kill is what we're using and then that's the format. We look up from our BPF map. We, and after processing some information, we submit an event, we submit a perf event uh, to be read back. And this is what we read from in the user space and get that information out. And finally, we start our perf event loop. We print some stuff out. The lol is the name of the binary we're using because I was bored uh, and I didn't get time to change it. So that's that's what lol is. Um, 
we print some stuff out, and then yeah. Now coming to the program itself that we're gonna be running, right? So we're gonna spawn 10 Go routines. Five of them are going to do some CPU intensive work. Five of them are gonna do some moderately CPU intensive work. So we'll look at what CPU, in oh, before that. We aren't, we are deliberately not unlocking this thread. The reason for that is if we unlock the thread, if a Go routine finishes computation and the thread is unlocked, that thread is reused. So we don't get the performance metrics that we will soon explain. So what we want to do is, this is meant to simulate a long running application. So if it's a long running application with a logged Go routine and a thread, that thread is essentially not going to be reused. So we're just discarding the thread altogether. So that's why we're not unlocking it on purpose. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the CPU intensive work, moderately CPU intensive work. What does that do, right? So the CPU intensive work. I don't know what I was doing when that happened. Yeah, there we go. So CPU intensive work is basically, we are multiplying two matrices of size 1024, right? Large matrices of size 1024. And the moderately CPU intensive work is just a subset of that comp computation. So to think of it in asymptotically, you have CPU intensive as N cube, O of N cube, and moderately CPU intensive as O of N square. So for a large enough number, the difference can be significant. Um, so great, we'll run now. Okay. So a little bit context now. Uh, preemption snoop is what we are doing uh, to get the stuff. This is where we're running our binary. And we are going to run perf to get scheduling latencies of all threads in the system. So that's what that is going to do. It's gonna record scheduling latencies. And here, we are going to um, average. average over the wait times of each thread that we care about. So I'll tell you what that means, but this is what that is doing. So time hist hyphen t thread ID is going to give us, this is the wait time as a histogram of this thread ID within this recording period. And then we're going to average over all the wait times and see what the scheduling latencies are. And then you'll see what the thread IDs and all that are, but just a little bit context. So uh, we are running our program. This is just to see what the EVPF outputs. So we have time, PID, command, signal ID, and TID. So TID is the thread receiving the signal. PID is the process which is responsible for sending the signal. SIG is the code which is 23, and command is the process that we are, that got, that did this thing basically. So now if we run our binary, you see like a bunch of stuff coming in. So you have one, six, seven, eight, three, blah, 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 blah. Uh, these are the threads that are receiving SIGODs essentially. So now that we have done that, we can actually capture some of this data and visualize what this looks like, right? So we'll visualize a little bit about what thread is getting how many signals and stuff like that. So now we've done that. We are running perf, uh, perf shed to get scheduling latencies. And here we will run our binary. So binary is running. We are also logging what the thread IDs of the moderately intensive and intensive go routines are. So you can see we have five intensive go routines doing some CPU intensive work. We have five moderately intensive go routines doing some moderately CPU intensive work. And these are the thread IDs that they're running on. And the reason that this is reliable to do is because we've logged it on. So we are logging the thread ID of each. Um, this is done to like prove a point. You don't need to do this at all. So now that we have this data, let's stop the profiling, let's stop the snooping, and we can actually log some of it out. Okay. So this is, these are the thread IDs which are getting a lot of SIGURGS. If you notice, the thread IDs that are getting a lot of SIGURGS are the thread IDs of the intensive calls, which is intuitively is, makes sense because if they're intensive, if they're long running, if they're long running, they get preempted and they'll come back again, they get preempted again, come back again, preempted again, so on, so on, so on. So this is, you get, an in, you get some form of insight into what thread might be running long running go routines essentially. This is what that does.
so yeah now we will get average so we will take and that's the um, uh, of the priority of the thread so sorry misspoke so this is the thread id we are getting the wait times of the thread id as a histogram then all the wait times we are just averaging over that and that's that's the wait time that the um, that thread that's the amount of time on average that thread has spent waiting in the kernel scheduler waiting to be scheduled essentially right so moving on what we can do next is um if your intensive load right if your intensive go routines are extremely latency sensitive for example what you can now do is you can in increase the priority of that uh, go routine because we know that they are long running anyway we know that they are extremely mission critical they are latency sensitive whatever we can increase the priority of that now now if we increase the priority of this so we do get priority set priority and we set it to minus 20 which is the highest value for a priority you can set for the cfs scheduling policy so we do same thing we get similar values uh oh hold on so if you saw you got like a much higher value so let me go back you got like a much higher value so 0.15 that was 0.0 something which is counterintuitive which is not should not happen then we realized low level profiling low level performance measurements are extremely noisy they are very 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 noisy especially we are trying to profile the kernel scheduler which is taking care of essentially everything that is happening on your machine so raghav suggested you know what let's reboot the machine and get rid of some of the uh, noise so that we can get a better result and this is why i'm saying this is this might be useful for a long running thing because if since the effect of noise is amplified by the shortness of your window so if it's long enough you can have better results so let's look at what that looks like right we are back here so so what you see here is previously we took just one thread and we took the latency of that now we're averaging latencies across all threads so we dumped all that to a file did some hacky bash and this is what the average looks like um So now that we are running the optimized code, and if this doesn't work, well, we can't help it. But yeah, so you get. Hold on, can I? Can I move this? Okay. So you get 20 milliseconds here. The previous run after reboot was 27 milliseconds across all threads. This was another reboot. We ran it again. We get 20 milliseconds. So you get like a seven milliseconds thing. which by the way is very much within the window of error so you might just like it might not be optimized so while trying to debug get this to work we learned like raghav and i learned some pretty interesting things uh, which is what you might see if you were to do something like this if you increase the priority of a certain threads right so previously you had 10 threads each at the same low priority now you have five threads at a higher priority and five at a lower priority So, if you were to take wait times, the lower priority threads essentially have a longer wait time now because you're priority prioritizing this. So, you need to be extremely sure that your latency critical application is really critical because you're going to be starving other ones then. 
Um, another thing is, now that you have five threads at the same priority, there is contention amongst these five threads. So if you are really, really like you, if, you, if you can pinpoint what your really critical thread is, increase priority of just that. Um, another thing is, in, in, instead of increasing priority, you can just not worry about this contention problem. Change the scheduling policy. Change the scheduling policy of your intensive threads to, let's say, real-time scheduling, which almost always is preferred over CFS in the kernel scheduler. So if it's a real-time scheduling thing, you're always given priority for a better run. Um, anything else? Caveats? Maybe about the fact that uh, what eBPF achieved here and uh, it couldn't, what the core scheduler couldn't do. Uh, we, like everything that we've talked about so far, uh, increasing or decreasing priorities of the thread or changing the scheduling policy uh, targeted at certain threads, this may or may not be, that's one of the, this may or may not be good design decisions, but the fact that you can do this is that you're able to capture those SIGURGs uh, using eBPF and pinpoint and basically do, uh, uh, throw the thread ID which uh, gets these SIGURGs and get your information about where uh, your intensive uh, processes are running. So that's, I think, if you're making a point, it's that. Yeah. We're able to uh, look a little bit deeper in, into the black box that, uh, of the runtime that Madhav mentioned in his slides. I mean, I did mention this is a solution looking for a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you might even ask, why not just log the thread, thread IDs like you did here? Why even run IVPF, right? The reason for that is, let's say you've deployed an application that's already running. You wouldn't normally log these thread IDs unless you see that there's a performance issue and then you get the insight that, oh, something might need to be done here. Um, if you have to log these thread IDs, you have to go back into your code, log the thread IDs, redeploy, and stuff like that. This is zero instrumentation. This is no instrumentation required to your existing deployment in, in production. So that's another and Plus you're capturing system. syscalls, which, yeah. Yeah, which you can't do with. You can, this is for scheduler, by the way. There's a whole other field for garbage collection because garbage collection is a really, really intricate and beautiful topic in itself. And Go Runtime uses syscalls for all of that as well. So there is a CNCF project called Pixie, um, which helps trace garbage collection of the Go runtime using EBPF. So that's, I couldn't find anything for the scheduler, so uh, there you have it. If it's useful or not, you can tell me later. Uh, but yeah, I, let me see if there are. Oh, and if you were curious, this is what we use for the averaging part. So we have a file with all thread IDs. Um, we get the thread ID for each thread using this command, and we average over that, and then we average over all of the averages. Uh, I think I'm just weirdly proud of this part. <laughs> it's so simple, but the fact that I got to use awk and just inline all the averaging, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, so conclusion. Yep. Yeah, so eBPF is a fast and safe way to extend uh, the functionality of a kernel. Uh, do you, okay. Go scheduler is a distributed and uh, best effort uh, preemptive scheduler. Go scheduler and the runtime in general interact uh, with the OS using syscalls, one of which we captured and got information out of. Uh, information about the Go runtime, which would not otherwise be visible, uh, is captured uh, using eBPF. Uh, latency sensitive, uh, aggressive optimizations are maybe possible at the kernel level uh, enabled by eBPF. Maybe. I, maybe, I don't maybe. know. <laughs> yeah, great. So this is where the, um, the, the script is for all of this, uh, where the EVF program is defined everything over there. So GSE is actually a demo for the original talk I did, which is like exporting scheduler traces to Prometheus. So we can visualize run like the Go schedulers, local run queue lengths and global run queue lengths and visualize work stealing happening in real time. So that's what that is. Uh, references, there is no documentation because they don't want us to know the internals of it. So you have to read the source code, which I did. And this is what you need to read. And you need to read the corresponding Git blims of that source code to understand what's going on. And you need to read the unit tests, modify the unit tests, run it for yourself. Um, so leave it to people like me who love to suffer. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, these are like a great bunch of references to you. Yeah, uh, for eBPF, everything eBPF basically points you to the eBPF IO, 
a uh, great place to see if there's summits happening or just what they're about. Uh, what is eBPF, the O'Reilly? The talk was, uh, th this was this was my first intro to eBPF. It was his book. I stole it and I read it and I found it interesting. Uh, that's something that you should check out. Maps, a very uh, interesting concept uh, in eBPF. Uh, that's, I think, a blog post that I liked about it. Core and portability, like I mentioned during the talk, uh, how it handles portability is very interesting, a little out of scope for this talk, but please do check it out. I think we're sharing it videos. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> any third set of questions? I'm sure the demo was pretty boring. No, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, so, like over there, we mentioned when you were talking about the Go scheduler, and that is, by the way, like a really great talk. Thanks for pe keeping this together. Uh, so, uh, most of the async runtimes, when you see in general, currently worked on poll based APIs from kernel, ePoll. Like, I think it's, I just checked the source code, it's also, yeah. Uh, Go also uses ePoll. Uh, do we have any advances? Or Adopt them. Are you using no? Not, not yet. yet. No. Uh, Netpolar uses ePoll. Netpolar uses. Uh, Ayo Uring is not yet uh, being discussed as far as I know. Uh, but at least if while we're talking about advances in the scheduler, there are talks to m improve the scheduler to make it more CFS-like. Uh, what that would mean in terms of implementation details of using ready-based or completion-based APIs, we don't know. Uh, at least Ayo Uring, I haven't seen it being discussed in the runtime space yet. That makes sense, thanks. Hi, great talk by the way. Uh, I just have one question regarding that eBPF script, right? It has been written in Python, what I see. Is it like only we can use Python for it or we could write in Go or how is it? You can theoretically write an eBPF user space program in any language, uh, but generally, so your, your eBPF, your language needs to support spitting out bytecode because that's the only thing that can be loaded into the kernel. So C, Rust, Go, Python, these are uh, good examples of languages that you can write your user space programs into. Yeah, also they, yeah, go on. basically that. And, uh, so you can write it in Go as well, but it's a little frustrating to work with eBPF in Go because the libraries that exist are essentially C bindings into the eBPF library. The reason that was in Python is because one, it's really easy to prototype. And second, because Python has support for LLVM, which is what eBPF needs for bytecode emission and uh, just-in-time compilation. So that's why Rust is really popular for eBPF, right? LLVM support. Um, Go has a separate compiler called TinyGo, if you know about it. Uh, TinyGo has support for LLVM, which is why it's really popular for eBPF plus Tiny plus Golang use cases over there. But just the normal uh, default libraries for eBPF, like what Aquasec provides, uh, those are basically C bindings into the BPF library, and that's it can get frust like a little frustrating to deal with because uh, yeah, we yeah. know how. C and works. I think another restriction that you have is that not all languages support the libbpf yeah. uh, library, which is basically used for your portability stuff. Uh, it's the library that uh, tells the user pro uh, the eBPF program how the data structures are within the kernel. Uh, I think Go does support C, Python, Go, Rust. These are languages that have support for that library. Thank you. You mentioned uh, continuous profiling, right? Are there uh, standard tools available to do this? You call them standard, but there are a few popular ones. So for example, long, I mean, this is a pretty old one, Pyroscore. Uh, that's continuous profiling, but with eBPF is something Rafana is working on now. Uh, there is a startup called Polar Signals, if you know about it. Uh, that has a CNCF project called Parka. Uh, Parka is eBPF-based continuous profiling agent. So uh, these are tools you can take a look at and use. They're pretty user-friendly as far as I've used them. Also, the, uh, the signals that you got out of this profiling, right? How is it consumed generally? Like, are there, uh, like, do you use some kind of an exporter to send the data somewhere? You could, you could. But since 
we didn't have a lot of time. We just used the tool to print ASCII barcodes. You could, uh, so since that's being consumed in Python, you have all the signal IDs in Python. You could just use the Prometheus Python library to export it out to Prometheus and do whatever you want there. Okay. Visualize it in Grafana for everything. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Someone over there. Yeah, I have a general question. So, so when we load a code in that uh, kernel using EPBF, so there will be user uh, mode to kernel mode. So there will be context switching. So like things like, uh, so I, I have a use case like uh, I'm building some encryption decryption uh, stuff. So we have to maintain a data structure like lookup or caches and all. There will be frequent data updates. So these type of tasks, how are we going to handle it? Like it's already a CPU intensive and EPF, EPBF is already like CPU. So is it like EPB is not for a CPU intensive task or uh, do we have some, some optimization or tool on application level to handle this stuff? When you, so a, a, a problem that ABPF is trying to solve is to uh, reduce these contexts, which is once you have loaded the program into the ABPF kernel, uh, the only time that you need to have another context switch is if you want to read from the maps into the user space. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can choose not to do that. Uh, the other option, for example, uh, in a sidecar model, which is generally compared to the eBPF, there you have constant uh, context, there you have constant syscalls being made into the kernel space uh, from like a sidecar pod or a container that's running that's monitoring the kernel space, for example. E with using eBPF, you don't need to do that because the program that's monitoring is already running inside the kernel. So all those context switches, uh, you don't need to worry about them. Okay, so on applic application level, we can optimize this stuff, I mean, uh, like uh, like you said about the threats and all, like prioritizing the threats and also via that that way we can optimize this stuff, like high intensive task, you mean? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, so now that you have the thread IDs, uh, you can look into, so perf also gives you number of context switches for that thread. Uh, if you want to use perf, if you want to use slash proc, if you want to use whatever tool, you can even monitor the number of context switches if that's important to you. Yeah. Plus, no. if you are optimizing, an interesting thing that eBPF provides is uh, something called BPP, BPF stats enable. Uh, I think this was from kernel 5.1 or so, uh, where you can basically see uh, the latencies that your uh, probes are uh, causing within your kernel space or the context which is everything. So you can switch that uh, on and get all the stats for all your probes that are deployed in the kernel. Got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Great. Thanks a lot. This was, this was fun. Yeah. <laughs>